You guys are ready to eat, aren't you? Drink? Something? Cool. Um, you can hear me, I'm assuming. Um, I, I got to check something. I, got 80, I have 85 slides. Um, and you can get them all here. Uh, you can either follow along on your laptop. I'd rather you pay attention to me because I'm going to say stuff that's not on the slides, kind of related to the slides. Um, but I, I do want to make sure all of you download them because certain parts of it I might go through kind of fast. And they're actually very prescriptive. So there are things that you can go do with your customers or something like that. Um, but before I get into that, I've booked at, bookended it with things that are not really related to the topic. Uh, but they're very related to all of you. So uh, I, I can't name how many people in this room have asked me about this. Uh, this being, uh, I, I'm one of the few people probably on the planet, maybe, I, I like to believe I'm special, but that's uh, raise money and has a self-funded business or two all at the same time. So you would think that I would have information about this. Um, many of you have heard about my pet peeve of not calling it a lifestyle business or bootstrapping and calling it self-funding. Um, so I'm going to talk about this first. So first of all, uh, and, and hopefully so, no one asked me again, at least in this audience, about this. So please pay attention. Uh, so when you, when you self-fund, uh, you spend the money, uh, sorry, uh, hold up, oh yeah. When you raise money, uh, you spend the money ahead of, uh, you can spend the money ahead of your revenue. So people are giving you money, you get to spend it, uh, and that, that's the simple explanation of sell, uh, sort of raising money uh, that I have, and uh, that's all I got. Like, I think a lot of people want to talk about how it's evil or there's, you know, investor vultures, etc. but it's actually not like that. It's like they, they just want a return from their investment, and you get to use their money ahead of actually having the money from your customers. It's very straightforward, actually. Uh, and then when you self-fund, which is what most of you in the room, if not all of you, are like, which is uh, sort of, I think, the sort of most genuine way you could probably build a business, because you're all here to make money, but I'll get a little bit more into that later. You're actually just making money as you make it from your customers. I know some of you might have services businesses. I did before I created my software, but it was still making money from customers so I could fund software, either for those customers or somebody else. So. Um, just wanted to clear that up so people don't ask me about it. Uh, people do ask me, what do I prefer? These sentences, these two sentences kind of explain it all for me in the sense that I don't actually prefer either. I think there's a time and place for both. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I would say myself, my, my funded experience from a scale of like awesome to really shitty was probably like a five or a six. So it wasn't that shitty, but it wasn't that awesome. It was like an average experience. My, my funded company, I'm not running it anymore. Uh, it's still running. We have a CEO and whatnot. And uh, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm at peace with it. I'm happy. But it's because of uh, my self-funded company, why I'm happy about that. So, um, and I've got some graphs later. Uh, you guys know Valve? They make some games and stuff. Anybody know Valve? OK. Do you know their, did you guys know that it's a self-funded company? OK, great. So they have this handbook. And I was going through it the other day for a bunch of reasons. And it's the Valve Handbook. There's a link at the bottom. You guys hopefully have my slides. And the thing they said is uh, well, Valve is self-funded. This, like, this is called the Valve Facts That Matter. We haven't ever brought in outside financing. Since our earliest days, this has been incre incredibly important in providing freedom to shape the company and its business practices. I think that's why I'm excited about self-funding. You, you actually do get to shape it in a, in a little bit of a different way because you don't have this any kind of pressure of somebody wanting to get a return from the business besides you wanting to get a return, quit your job, make sure you never have to work for anyone else again, et cetera. So I, I thought this was just a really good way. I really like that handbook, too, because uh, they have the self-funded perspective, and it's very rare to see this kind of content, especially at a very large company. So in the, in, in the style of Rob, I wanted to include the what's in it for all of you sort of slide. So what I'm going to go through, and it's really interesting. I, so I've spoken here five years. Spoken on lots of different sort of topics here and with all of you in person. And one of the things that I've, I, I, I'm excited about this year is um, we're talking about product. We're talking about product market fit. I hadn't really heard the term here even last year, if I'm not mistaken. And we've heard it a couple times, so I thought a great way to end the day would be to talk a lot about that uh, and then sort of how I think about that, how I've done it, but also how you can do it too. And, and so. Um, I heard a few things earlier today and yesterday about some people saying we're talking a lot about SaaS. And this is obviously, this is actually crazy egg SaaS, slow SaaS, what is it, long, slow SaaS ramp of death. That's, 
I guess that's what it is. Um, and uh, this is the signups over time, and it's obviously incomplete. And I have slides. I have the completeness later. Um, so the big thing I wanted to say is who's SaaS in here already working on something SaaS right now? Okay, cool. So like 30, 40 percent. Who's not working on a SaaS yet, but is going to and knows that for sure? Okay, a few more. So that's about 50 percent. So all the rest of you, this is relevant to you too. And if you have questions about how to apply it to your business, come see me or ask a question later. I don't want to exclude all of you because that it's important uh, to be contextual, at least in my opinion, and make sure half the audience also gets value. So please ask questions about that. All this is applicable to non-SAS too. I wanted to make, I want to get that out of the way. Um, but either way, in a self-funded business, I actually, I get the, I have the most fun working on a self-funded business because I've learned to love, love constraints. And one of the things that I think uh, you can do in a self-funded business is you have this massive constraint of needing money, uh, having probably limited time to work on whatever you're working on, your SaaS product or whatever you're doing. Um, so you really have to focus. <clears throat> you probably shouldn't get me started on focus. I'd usually show you my formula. I have a little formula about it, but I'm not going to show you the formula. I took it out today because I don't want to get into it, but focus is super important. Um, I think that's been a trend in most of the talks today. It started with Patrick t giving, telling you what he, would do, what he would do today that he didn't do himself uh, about focusing in on like a single product, single thing, et cetera, single market even, or customer segment. So uh, I, I can't stress this enough. And in the beginning, um, this was a study somebody did. A lot of them were venture funded, but it's still relevant. Of, they, did like, they did a study of like 100 startups. And they came up with the top reason that uh, startups fail, which is no market need. Um, and uh, it's like by like 40 something percent. So when they surveyed these people, they came up with all these things. I'm gonna rattle off some of them because they're really interesting and very relevant to us too. So it's no market need, ran out of cash, not the right team, got uh, outcompeted, pricing cost issues, poor product, uh, need lack of business model, I don't know why, um, poor marketing, ignoring customers, that's a good one. Uh, Product mistimed, okay, so they thought their timing was wrong, okay. So lost focus, disharmony on team slash investors, we don't have that investor problem. Uh, pivot gone bad, lack passion, bad location, no financing investor interest, again, we don't have that problem. Legal challenges, didn't use network advisors, burnout, failure to pivot. So if you think about most of those, my belief and the way I think about the world is product actually solves a lot of those problems, uh, not some of the things that people said. For example, product mistimed, it's probably something where you should change your product. Uh, poor marketing, it's probably poor product. Uh, poor product is poor product. Uh, pricing cost issues, yeah, well, that's some, probably something with your product or your pricing. Um, and, and a bunch of these are actually related to product, so I think uh, no market need is obviously related to product because you built a product nobody cared for. So the whole thesis here, because this is really about accelerating your growth and making sure you can grow with without working yourself to death and also not having to spend like 120 hours a week or whatever uh, working on your business. Uh, but many of us, I'm sure, do just because we like it. Uh, so it's like you can't actually grow your business unless you have product market fit. So you're probably wondering by now, like, what is product market fit? Um, so who actually knows what it is? I'm not going to call you out and ask you to define it. I got all that. But like, who knows what it is? OK. And, and, or do you think you know what it is? Yeah, OK, that's the honesty. Yeah, I barely know what it is, too, but I'm going to do my best to explain what I know. Uh, so this actually came from Mark Andreessen. He's a VC, don't hate him, he's great. Uh, he built Netscape, uh, if you guys don't know. And he works at a, a firm called A16Z, Andreessen Horowitz. And he basically said, if fit, uh, product market fit means being in a good market with a product that can satisfy the market. And that's the, he came up with the term, and that's what he defined it as. So you need to be in a good market with a product that can satisfy that market. Again, it's back to product. Um, so. Uh, how do you know if you're in a good market or how do you know if you have product market fit? Um, the strongest signal I've found in my businesses and just with all the people that I've talked to and things I can see out there is like basically uh, uh, your customers. And uh, they tend to have the answer on a lot of things and it's hard for us to like think about that uh, all the time, but like they're a great signal. So one of them is strong word of mouth. So uh, this is a bunch of tweets uh, from back in the day from cra and some recent ones from Crazy Egg and Kiss Metrics about people just saying awesome things. So obviously that made me feel good but um, wasn't necessarily uh, uh, beyond that. It was just like public tweets we had. So I heart Crazy Egg. Crazy Egg is a bomb, seriously. Guys, Crazy Egg is an amazing tool. I must have a, I must have, a must have simple solution to increase conversion. Uh, love Crazy Egg. Uh, I'm really loving the people reporting Crazy Egg. 
all kinds of stuff. Oh, this was a, one of my favorites. Overhearing some developers at Starbucks evangelizing Crazy Egg just as I'm researching them. Way to go, guys. And I know many of you might think, oh, Heaton, you have a blog and you have, you know, like your, your Heaton Cha or whatever, and, uh, you know, you're good at marketing or whatever. But, like, this was when we were in a, a closed beta type thing, or early access is what I prefer. And um, people were just using the product. So it wasn't when we were doing a lot of marketing, it wasn't because of us. It was purely because of the product very early on. And um, another one here uh, was, uh, <clears throat> uh, this is actually about Kiss Metrics and Kiss Insights, another product we built, which is it, someone's saying it's amazing. But anyways, I'm not showing you because it's awesome, but that's an indicator, right? So sometimes you'll get these things in your email box from support. Sometimes people will randomly tell you that when you walk up to them. But this is like the strongest sign because word of mouth um, <clears throat> from an even growth standpoint, that's most people's number one channel once they hit some level of scale. It's basically direct visitors coming and you don't know why they're coming to your site. And that's basically word of mouth. Another one I like to think about is customer addiction. Um, so uh, this person basically was up at 2 a.m. when they realized the problem and they started creating funnels in Kissmetrics. And this was in 2011. So I went back and tried to figure all this out because I was just really curious about product market fit. Uh, Crazy Egg, love what you guys created. I'm addicted to this service. It's exactly what I needed for my new online business. Great, awesome. Uh, this is one of my favorites, uh, better than alternative. So when customers are actually saying that, and by the way, all these tweets are completely unsolicited. So we don't make you tweet, we don't tell you anything. They're just doing it because they want to. Um, with these new features Kissmetrics is adding, I'm seriously considering if I still need Google Analytics. Um, this one is, Google Analytics is great, but Kissmetrics may have literally changed our business. <clears throat> So uh, now I'm going to actually not just talk about sort of uh, you know, all that stuff about the signal, because I think the signal is actually very clear. It's when customers are raving about it. Raving lunatics is what you want. Uh, I could probably do a whole talk on how to get raving lunatics, but I, that is what this talk's about. Uh, so um, here, uh, this one's very interesting for me, and I think Samuel's going to laugh. But basically, this person said, trying out Kissmetrics and Crazy Egg. Crazy Egg was very easy to set up, still working on Kissmetrics. So that was a massive fail. Uh, the onboarding there, uh, yeah, we made mistakes. But anyways, um, at, and Crazy Egg's been very simple. And part of the reason is product. Part of the reason is where we focus our time in that business. So this is my thesis on product market fit and what you need to do. This is my hack. But it's literally find the critical problems, find the most important problems, and just solve them. Like, that's it. And I know it sounds really basic, but that's all we did at Kissmetrics, at Crazy Egg, to come to this sort of conclusion. Um, so, uh, a lot of you, you know, I don't think I can use as colored language as Steli because he just totally just crushed it on that. Um, but for me, uh, and he did it in the right way, it wasn't like Dave McClure style, which is dropping the F-bombs for no reason. But like, I, I, I have this habit where like, I'll look at a product, I'll even look at a thing, anything, and I'll just be like, why does this fucking suck? And, and, and that's all I do. And, and it, you might have heard me if I'm reviewing a product with you or something. It's like, you can make this like 10 times better. Like, why does it suck? And so the pattern I found in even my own work to reach product market fit was simply figuring this out. So I would find an important part of an existing product and really figure out why it sucked. Part of it is my own intuition, but then that informed hypotheses to sort of go deeper in. So I'm going to give you some examples. And then obviously you have to make a 10x better. If you don't make a 10x better, it's not, it's not really going to get product market fit. People are not going to tweet about it. You're not going to get the word of mouth you need and you're not going to be able to figure it out. So with Crazy Egg, um, and this is a pattern I've noticed about a couple of our products. That's why I wanted to kind of bring it up like this. But we try to figure out what's wrong with uh, Google Analytics site overlays. Has anyone ever used a Google Analytics site overlay or attempted to? OK, some of you have. Awesome. Um, great. So uh, this is actually a new, their new version of it. I had to install some Chrome extension and put it up. I did it on the Quick Sprout homepage. Um, and, and there's a number of problems we had with it. And back in the day, it was even a little bit more worse uh, than it is right now, because they wouldn't even tell you that these problems existed in their interface. But simply put, um, we looked at the product, we looked at the site overlay, and we knew that people really cared about seeing where people clicked. Um, that's also what we learned from our customers, basically. That's what they said about the site overlay. And I'll get into that a little bit deeper on how we learned that. Um, but basically, what would happen is, this is literally clicks. All those orange boxes that you can probably barely see, like at the top and all that, are showing me the clicks. But the main area is that middle area, and I don't see any clicks in it. And this is like from like three days ago, their site overlay. So they still haven't fucking fixed it, right? So like it's basically useless to you. And at the time when we built Crazy Egg, uh, things like, uh, anyone remember Ajax? 
So we were developers, right? Yeah, Ajax was the shit. This was like 2005, 2006. And we realized that we could do a bunch of tracking. There's actually a funny story about that. When we were tracking every click, at one point, um, and this was during an early access beta period, we basically um, redirected every click from every site that was running us to our homepage. We got a lot of signups that day. <laughs> so that, that was, yeah, that was bad. But anyways, that, that was when like, the stuff was a little bit harder than it is today. Uh, and so what we learned is we needed to track every click. They also had this other stupid problem, which was basically if you have two links on the page, they still have this problem, and both of them go to your about page, one has 10 clicks, another has five, they show both as 15. Now they have a disclaimer when you hover over it, oh, it says 15 in both because that's the total clicks. But how is that useful to you when you're trying to assess this page and make it better? And not to mention, they don't track the clicks on the button, they don't track the clicks on the form field, they don't track the clicks on the, on the little like compare up to three of your competition or whatever. So super annoying. Um, I just put this TechCrunch thing in there to just explain that like when we released this product, even the press was saying the tagline we want that wanted them to say because it was just right and it made perfect sense to them. So it was see what your visitors are doing with Crazy Egg. We, we, we figured that out. That's like our bread and butter. Um, and th by the way, this is a heat map of the same page or another version of it, but similar page. You can see where the hot spots are. It's very obvious. I mean, this is why people love the product. Um, and you can see where all the cold spots are and you know, all that kind of stuff. So we're actually very accurate. So we figured out that the problems that Site Overlay had were very specific and we literally designed a product to solve them. And back then it was actually technically somewhat challenging to do that. And this is the reason this business works. The only reason. There's, there's, there's a couple other differentiators like, site, like um, your website changes all the time, obviously, like you'd make changes and stuff. And so we didn't want an always on analytics tool. We built it so you could start a test. We called them tests back then. But let's say start a snapshot and, and it turns off after a certain period of time and we're done. So there's some things about the business that you know, make it so that we have some retention and churn issues because of that. But that was a key proposition that even people that copied us didn't figure out. The whole idea is you have to turn this on and off because by the time, if you have it always running, whatever you're looking at might be completely irrelevant in terms of the data that you're looking at. So it was more meant to be an improvement tool to help you improve things by analyzing them like in pockets of time and number of clicks and stuff like that. Um, this, uh, because of the proposition, uh, actually this is uh, the WordPress, the old school WordPress.com homepage from back in the day, or it might be .org, I don't remember. I think it was .com actually. And they were one of our first uh, customers within the first 30 to 60 days. They were in the early access and stuff like that. But because it was such a strong sort of product market fit because of the analysis we did, we were able to get a shit ton of customers at the time uh, all over the place. And, and we kept going. Um, I still haven't seen anyone copy this feature of ours, but it's uh, track every click with our confetti. Uh, so this is a report. We called it confetti, made up a kind of funny name. Uh, I'd probably name it something different now, although I think it kind of makes sense. Uh, and there's dots on the screen, colored. I'm sure some of you have used it. Um, and we got some love for that. People, people mentioned it in the tweets. Uh, somebody else mentioned it. So it's got, it, it, we really just doubled down on what we knew. See where people click. Don't make it, compl make it complicated. Make it easy to use. And we even did that with a confetti feature. So this is not just about like, oh, you could do this once, figure out what sucks, and then make a product against that. We have to keep kind of going deeper and deeper, and, and we did do that. Um, so Kiss Metrics. So we kind of did something similar, so I want to talk about that. And this is, I know it's a funded company, but I'm going to tell you that it's like, we had a very small team at the time. It was three or four people, very similar to many of your teams, and we, and we did a lot of really ghetto stuff. So the first version of Kiss Metrics was built in a month, and this is the version that's running right now. We had a bunch of iterations before that, but this was all new code. Um, so it was built in a month from scratch, so zero lines of code to release. We use EC2 S3 Ruby and uh, 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 SQLite, and that was uh, a very conscious decision. It was horribly slow and ugly code, it had bugs, and it took seven servers for just 30 customers. That's where the funding kind of helped a little bit, but um, that's kind of how it worked for us, and it was very ghetto, and I, I think uh, a lot of people probably wouldn't do any of this, but there was a very specific reason we did it. By then we had learned that we need to do it fast, and we need to get it right, and we need to get it in customers' hands fast. So um, in the same form of uh, basically as uh, Crazy Egg, we asked a single question, basically, what's wrong with Google Analytics funnels? Uh, one of the things here was like, we had an opinion about both of these things, and I know this looks like a pattern, it was kind of accidental in some ways, but our opinion was that there's important pieces of analytics, and we should literally, they should just be the product, that's a great way to start. Now if you ever read like, uh, Innovator's Dilemma or any of those kind of books around like innovation and stuff like that, you'll learn that this, there's this concept of 
uh, basically bundling and unbundling. Basically markets start out with like single point solutions and then they keep adding features and then they become a bundle of a bunch of features and then you can unbundle them. So um, we were basically just unbundling analytics, picking off the important stuff and doing it better. And part of the reason is Google Analytics made the market. Everyone uses Google Analytics. It's a free tool. By then it was very popular already. Uh, so we just wanted to, we just figured we could go do that and build a business out of that. Uh, so this is how funnels looked. In Google Analytics, they were top to bottom and they had some stuff going on. They were kind of complicated. Uh, they had a whole bunch of other issues like, uh, has anyone ever tried to build a funnel in Google Analytics? Yeah. Has anyone successfully done it on the first try? All right. Awesome. So that was the problem, right? So there's this bunch of issues. Like you have to, back then you had to track the data. You have to go, go to their page, build the kind of funnel. Then I think you had to track the data. Uh, at that time they didn't even have an event, so it was only on pages. And then you had to wait 24 hours to see if that data was correct. Then you had to like audit the tracking and all that kind of stuff to make sure it was correct. And then you might still have gotten it wrong. And if you're in a little bit of a larger company or you're not a developer, you're basically having to communicate with them. They get frustrated, you get frustrated. Maybe a week later, you have something that you think you can use. But you might still not trust it because of all that effort you went through. So that was a big problem. They wouldn't let you just track the data and do what Kissmetrics does, which is build everything on the fly. So that was a big innovation even in analytics that like, we discovered. Uh, and somebody improved their conversion at a step in their funnel from 20% to 95%, which I still debate whether that's accurate, but like, sounds cool, right? 20% to almost 100%? Cool. Uh, and they said they did it because of our funnel. So this is what an early version of the product looked like. It was just one report, one screen. Uh, there's all kinds of issues with it from a usability standpoint. This was the ghetto fast type version. In fact, we had this little constraint that's kind of weird. Um, because of how, built, how fast we built it, we could only show you the last 10,000 people through your funnel. And we couldn't do anything else. Uh, and that was a very deliberate constraint because we weren't trying to validate whether we could do years of data or you know, let you slice and dice it or anything. We just wanted to basically solve the core problem and the core problems we discovered with Google Analytics around tracking the data uh, and all that kind of stuff. So the simple first problem we solved was we wanted to make the data more accurate because Google Analytics data is not person-based. So we created a person-based API. This is the same API that still exists. Prior to, as far as our knowledge, prior to us doing this, it didn't exist. Uh, people weren't able to pass data into an analytics system based on a person. They only were able to do that uh, in their own back-end databases or with lots of work with Omniture. Um, somebody tweeted about it, so apparently, you know, all of you know how hard APIs are, but someone apparently liked ours. Um, we had this really other cool thing that we invented. Did, has, has anyone seen this in Kissmetrics? This is very old. Yeah, okay, Patrick, all right. Ah, Ben, awesome. So this thing was like, you know, Dig? Anyone remember Dig? Remember like Dig Spy, Dig Stack, any of that cool stuff, the visualization? So we got super inspired by that and said, what if you had that for your website? And we didn't build it just for that reason, but we built it because um, our engineer at the time, this was 09, 2009, end of 2009, he was very good in Flash and he was just really fast in it. So we built this in Flash, which had its own problems. And it was basically, every time you put event calls, you could basically see this live stream. And at, at that time, I think there was already Chartbeat and stuff, but no one was making, we built this with the purpose of debugging because of that problem with creating funnels and having to debug the data. So we totally built this thing and it was really cool. Some people put it up on the big screen and it was all colored and stuff like that. Um, but that was another part of like learning where the frustration was and having a solid solution for it. Um, and then this is another cool one. So, you know, many of you can say like, and I've done this mistake too, where it's like, okay, you did that, you built a product, then what? Like, how do you improve it, et cetera? So um, this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, we, we changed the live report. Someone was not happy with it. I gave the team feedback. They came back and said, and you know, on the whole, Sarah had her customer service and all that stuff. They were super stoked, because like, I didn't even tell him we fixed it, and he had figured out we fixed it. And it, was, it took about seven days, which is kind of crazy, but like, whatever. I guess he was happy. And he basically said, I've never seen a company as responsive to its customers as Kissmetrics. That put a smile on my face. But, um, and at the bottom is just someone saying how awesome the Kissmetrics Live was for exactly what we wanted, which was remains the best debugging tool from any third party service. So this is nailing it. Um, this was the ghetto version that we, uh, that we made that was really shitty. You couldn't see enough events and stuff like that. Then with the final version ended up being, uh, you know, 10 times better. And I know I don't usually share like stats, uh, so I'm going to share some stats. So I, I took this from a board deck. Uh, hopefully the investors aren't pissed, but it's from December 22nd, 2009. Um, and uh, it was about a month later. So we had a whole bunch of beta requests, a whole bunch of invitations sent, a uh, bunch of accounts created. 
uh, and lots of data. And, and, and bid sketch is on here because he was using our product at the time. Thank you, Ruben. I don't know if you're in the room. Um, and this was back in 09, so he's been a customer a long time, so he's old school like that on, on all, for all of us. Um, we had a bunch of other companies using it. But the reason I wanted to share this is like, this wouldn't have happened if we didn't nail it and, and people didn't like love it and care about using it. We had pretty good retention at the time and we had more volume than we knew what, what to do with. In fact, the, the lead engineer, it was only one engineer, one core engineer for the back end at the time, he had to go spend three months because of all the volume we had to just make everything work right after that ghetto period of, um, sort of the, the ghetto build that we did. Uh, this is another thing that like, uh, it's sort of, it, it, it's taken me some time to appreciate it, but like I think, I think it's really interesting to share. So when you get it right, um, basically eventually it becomes a norm. Uh, a more aggressive way to say that is everyone fucking copies you. So um, this is how funnels were. This is another funnel product. This is another funnel product. This is our product. And then this is everything after it. Oh, and Google copied it too. This is, this is like recently uh, for some crap they did. But, it, but we came up with that pattern and it just over and over and over. So when you get it right, it gets copied. Um, so I just wanted to make that point that you know you're getting it right if people are copying you. It's kind of the Apple effect, right? Everyone wants a fingerprint scanner on their phone now because Apple did it. Um, and Samsung has to, spend, has, has to spend a lot of money to do it because... Uh, Apple actually locked them out of the whole production of being able to do that because of the little technology there and stuff. It was very interesting. But anyways, I've seen this repeatedly. I mean, <clears throat> today you could probably do the same with heat maps and say that there's like 50 products with heat maps. Um, so anyways, it, it becomes a norm. It's, it, it's sort of frustrating, but whatever. Uh, you just got to keep going and think about what's next. Um, so how to analyze product market fit. So we did a lot of this. You can do a lot of this if you have a product. And I'm going to go through it. There's these uh, five different ways. So product market fit survey, net promoter score, retention cohort analysis, engagement, and churn. So I wanted to focus on the first one because I have a very strong competitive advantage on the first one to talk about. While the other four, I could probably link you to blog posts anytime and give you lots of details. Some of the people in this room have written about the other four. But this one I haven't really seen written about, so I want to talk about that. Uh, and it's bringing back something very old. This is stu the product market fit survey is a survey created by Sean Ellis. Um, and I know, how many of you have heard of it? Okay, cool. So, so not enough. All right, great. So I'm going to talk about new stuff. Great. And this is actually why I had you guys download the deck um, because uh, this is an important topic and uh, it's been very powerful for me. I learned it from Sean Ellis. Um, he's, uh, he was the marketer at Log Me In and, and he was an advisor to Dropbox and a bunch of stuff. He's badass. Uh, and he taught me everything I know about this kind of surveying. And he basically said, I asked existing users of a, pro of a product how they would feel if they could no longer use a product. It's a really powerful question. Um, it looks like this in the survey.io tool. It's survey.io. We helped build it with him. It was many years ago. Um, but if you're going to do this, uh, go use SurveyMonkey. Um, I've even got like a template if you guys just are so lazy where you don't want to copy these questions over. Uh, and I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I, I'm lazy too. I, I, would, I, would, I constantly use that template, so it's cool. But um, uh, let me know if you really want it and you have a SurveyMonkey account. You might need a pro one, sadly. Uh, I'm thinking about making a type form version or, or something like that. But the reason you want to do that is you want to be able to analyze the results. So I'm going to talk through this survey question by question. Um, so this is the survey. That was the main question, which basically asked, how would you feel if you could no longer use Google Analytics? I'll tell you why I use that in there in a second. Uh, and then it's very disappointed, somewhat disappointed, not disappointed. Please help us understand why you selected this answer. So one of the thing responses you'll get if your product has product market fit with some people is they get really scared that your product's going to go away. And, I, and I've gotten people that get afraid of that, of asking the question, but the whole point of the question is for people to get scared. So, so don't worry about that. Just, just go with it. Um, so the idea here is that if, if people are very disappointed and enough of them are very disappointed, you have product market fit. Uh, and I'm going to go through a little bit of that. But this is the key question that helps you segment the rest of the questions. Great survey methodology for analyzing surveys is all about segmenting the surveys and, and the responses in the right ways. Um, so this is, this is um, uh, actually, let me, let, me go back, let me go back. Let me find this slide. Hang on. Anyways, okay, so I'll talk about it here. So before I move on, um, and I might have a slide for this again, but it's not in the right order, whatever. But basically, we at Kissmetrics, before we released the product, before we came up with all those things, we actually ran this survey for Google Analytics customers. Because we didn't have a product, but we had a competitor, so to speak, and we had a specific thing we wanted to figure out. So we ran this survey with them, and what we learned uh, is that 
they have product market fit. Um, and so even if you tell me, I don't have a lot of customers, I, can't, I don't want to survey them or like whatever, you can go survey competitors. I'd even go spend money to go get their responses because I'm, I would be dying to know about all the competitors in the category, how people feel about them, whether they have product market fit, how people describe the products, et cetera. We've even ran the survey for Twitter and stuff like that before. Um, so here's a scenario. In this scenario, nobody really gives a shit about your product because 48% of the people said not disappointed. So they wouldn't be disappointed if your product um, kind of uh, didn't go away or went away. So in this case, there might be some signal if you go analyze the very disappointed responses and somewhat disappointed responses for the rest of the questions. Um, but uh, it's very likely you're going to have to go back to the drawing board and try a different sort of methodology. Again, if any of you want to run the survey or any of this stuff, I'm happy to get emailed and help you analyze it or teach you how to. Uh, but I'm planning on doing it in this, in, in this uh, presentation. So uh, another one here is when you have a lot of people that say somewhat disappointed uh, and maybe the very disappointed are even. What you're really aiming for is 40% or more of people saying they'd be very disappointed if a product no longer existed. And that's Sean Ellis's sort of rubric for saying, okay, you have some level of product market fit uh, and all that. So in this case, again, you're trying to figure out the difference between the two responses. Uh, and sometimes you can do product or customer segment tweaks. So I'll give you an example. So let's say that the people who are somewhat disappointed didn't experience a specific feature in your product while you realize with the written responses that the people who are very disappointed did experience it. And if you realize that, then what you can say is, okay, I can go try to improve, optimize, tweak my product, even my value proposition, so that the people who are somewhat disappointed are actually end up, I get more very disappointed people because they actually got exposed to the product. You could even get really crazy and try to email the people that said they're somewhat disappointed and sort of you know, usher them along uh, in the process. But the whole idea of this is analyzing it and analyzing it qualitatively. Um, again, uh, yeah, so this is where the slide, oh, sorry, it's the next one. Anyways, um, when the majority of people can't live without it, you're basically in a place to grow. Uh, and if anybody does surveying and gets to this point, just shoot me an email. You have a lot of work ahead of you, but you have such strong signal that like, you need to move fast and sort of jump on it because markets get crowded pretty fast. So if you have product market fit, it, it's just time to hit the gas and start growing the business and make sure as many people as possible, as fast as possible, can get value from your product. And then it's just about optimizing the shit out of everything uh, any way you can. Um, again, this is, uh, well, this is the data from the Google Analytics survey that we did. So basically here, uh, we learned that Google Analytics has a lot of product market fit. I think it's like 70 or 80% of people said they'd be very disappointed if it didn't exist. And we, we got about 1,000 responses on it. We tweeted it out. We, we did a bunch of advertising. We did whatever we could because we knew this data would be valuable to us because we're building a product that's somewhat competitive, if not exactly competitive to them. Um, and you guys can do all of this. So another question in the survey is about alternatives. So it's really, you know, you saw those tweets about alternatives um, that I said people were saying about our products uh, and how we're better than alternatives. So here it's like, what, what would you likely use as an alternative Google Analytics uh, were no longer av available? So a lot of times, like I think even in like Rob's case where he really didn't want to call it email marketing or, or, or marketing automation and stuff like that, um, he would have learned that pretty fast if he did this and, and he would have, it would have been more irrefutable than his own opinion or, or even having to go talk to a whole bunch of customers and interview them when you could have just surveyed them and figured out what kind of alternative they would use. So it's a really powerful question in that sense. Um, so this one is about the primary benefits. Uh, so what is the primary benefit that you have received from Google Analytics? So this is actually the one that we use to figure out the crazy egg tagline of show me my heat map. Or actually it was show me my heat map and see where people click uh, on your website. And uh, it was because that's the primary benefit they said. They just want to see where people click. Uh, and so we use that, and that's actually what converts the best for us. We haven't found a winner beyond that. We also use some of these answers to figure out the, 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 that copy that Joanna mentioned about show me, your, uh, sh uh, uh, show me my heat map. Um, uh, another one, this is a pretty standard question. Uh, it's about have you recommended Google Analytics to anyone? So you might think we're trying to figure out whether people have recommended it or not. We're not really trying to figure that out here. What we really care about is what they say when they say yes and they explain it. And that can inform a lot of your copy, your positioning, all that kinds of stuff because you're basically asking them to tell you how they told their friend. You're not, you don't really care that they did or not. That's actually not the most important thing here. The most important thing is understanding how they describe your product uh, to a friend because that's generally uh, going to give you the kind of copy you need for your site uh, to test and stuff like that. Um, and this one's just obvious. It's like, how, how could Google Analytics be improved to better meet your needs? Um, 
yeah, so that was the survey. I gave you guys the PDF. I know I went pretty fast through it. If you guys are so inclined to go try it with your customers because you have enough or more interesting to me, you want to try it with a competitor and learn how to like kind of do that, I'm super happy to help. Uh, this has been, this surveying has been the number one most valuable thing for me outside of all the quantitative stuff that I think has actually put me at an advantage when I'm analyzing customer bases uh, by doing this kind of survey. So thank you, Sean Ellis, for that. Uh, so I've got about 11 slides left, and I think I have time. Uh, so I'm going to keep going. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk more about product and talk about another like tactic. It's called working backwards. But so let me get started on that. And this is all before product market fit. It's all about getting to product market fit. So this is another sort of tactic. This one's not more of a hack. It takes a bunch of work, but it's really powerful. So uh, uh, have, has anyone seen this thing? This is where you have a skateboard and it goes to the car. How many of you have seen this before? Cool. This is like Spotify. Someone at Spotify did it. What I really like about it is that um, it gives MVP a perfect like, framework to think about. So when I build an MVP, now we just actually we don't even call it MVP anymore. We're, like, we're building the skateboard. Because a skateboard will get us from point A to point B, but a wheel won't unless we want to learn how to ride one wheel or whatever, like the one wheelie bicycle, which nobody really wants to do. Uh, and very few people can do it. So the idea is you're building a skateboard, then you build the little, uh, little razor type thing, and then bicycle, motorcycle, car. And as you do that, there's, there's more further distance that you can go, basically. Um, and, but the job that people are trying to do in this case is get from point A to point B, and all these things can do it. While the top stuff, you can't really do it. So that's how you want to think about your product. You want to think about it very holistically. Uh, if you think about back to the sort of uh, funnel with, funnels with KISS metrics, if we just solved one of those problems, it wouldn't be good enough. Uh, but we solved all those problems and built the skateboard, but it was super ghetto and we knew it. And we did it really fast. So that would be, a, I would say that's probably a really good example of MVP of getting every single part of the process right, but not worrying too much about making it a car. Instead, just saying, OK, it'll get people from point A to B. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we knew we had to fix, but we wanted to get in customers' hands fast. Um, and I know this is obvious. A lot of people, you know, customer development, interviewing, talking to your customers, you guys all know this. It's very important to do the research. This is why I'll do that product market fit survey on competitors, because that's actually a strong form of research. Um, but this, new, this tactic is, uh, that I want to talk about is called working backwards. How many of you have heard about this? Awesome. Great. So I'm teaching you something, maybe. Um, so, and I've iterated a little bit uh, after thinking about it, but basically it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a product development methodology from Amazon. It's actually how they build a lot of awesome product. Uh, it's actually why you have Prime and all these things, it's because of the way they think about it. And basically what they do is they try to basically, they, in their case, they write an imaginary press release with a specific structure, which I have laid out here from a Quora post. Um, uh, of, of basically the product launched, after it's launched, before they even sort of create the product. So if you're going to do that right, you're going to need a lot of thorough research, just like some of the stuff I described when we built product, and also you know, just basically doing interviews and stuff, so you actually understand the pain, uh, and you're able to write this. So in our product development now, we're always doing something like this. What we actually do now, I started out with, like we, we would do blog posts in our companies, um, and write these elaborate sort of blog posts, which are basically launch blog posts. We know when we nailed it when like that blog post is very similar to the one we write when we actually release the product. But the whole idea of this is to get a discipline around if I have to write that blog post first and I'm building the product, then like I know I, I know I immediately figure out what I don't know, what I know, what I need to know. I start thinking about the customer right away because I'm writing this for them. So uh, I think a blog, a blog post is the new press release. I'd even go further now, based on all those tweets I showed you from our companies, um, you should be writing tweets that you think people will say about the product. You know? That's what we do now. So we, we'll write tweets. We'll write maybe even up to like 50 tweets based on all these things we learn that are the critical problems that customers have in our market. Uh, and it's been really, 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 really valuable in saving a lot of time and even like crushing a lot of debates because we're actually working backwards. Um, they get a little more elaborate about it at, at Amazon. What they'll actually do, and this is a little bit uh, interesting, but they'll, like, um, they'll, they'll basically, basically what you're doing when you're working backwards is you're imagining a future state of uh, your customer or even your company or whatever, depending on what you're working backwards for. And normally what people do is they might be able to set a goal or a future state, uh, but then what they'll do is they'll figure out what they need to do from now till that goal. What Amazon does is they'll take that goal, and this is the reason they call it working backwards, 
they'll do, for that goal, what's the step before that? And then 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 they'll come to where they are today. They won't go forward. And the reason is, you're not really working backwards if you don't actually start from the end goal and work your way back to where you need to be today. And you get a lot of clarity. And you know, a lot of people say like building products or startups or whatever are like a zigzag thing. This actually makes your zigzag less zigzaggy because you actually have a clear idea. Of if, I, if I need to provide this specific product experience to win or to solve the problem, like I can't start from here. I have to start from what's like the one layer below that and so on. So um, anyways, if anyone's interested in talking about that, it's one of my favorite topics. Um, and just a good reminder, like you're not your customer. That's why we do all this. This is how we get it right when we don't think we're the customer and we actually realize we're not the customer. And yeah, you could start with the problem you have, but what's really key is to really understand that you are not your customer, even if it's a problem you have. Like, like you need the customer. Like it's, it's, it, you need to get their input. You need to get it earlier. All these things I talked about are all about getting it earlier and basically getting the product market fit faster um, before you even like write a line of code. Like I, I can, these days we can spec out and do designs in some of my companies and get to this know we have fit even before any the products launch or even built yet uh, just by doing a lot of these processes. Um, and, and some graphs, so uh, these are actually signups, trial signups over time for Crazy Egg. I showed you guys this when I started. Uh, this is where we are at right now. Uh, this was like, I think last month, and it just kept going up, and there's been some step functions. And yeah, we went through the ramp. Uh, but the thing I'm most excited about is actually this. So Hello Bar is my other business, and uh, we, we started when, since we bought it, and we actually revamped it. We actually didn't move, we still haven't fully moved the, the existing old customers over, so we basically started from zero. Um, and so I know people want to talk about SaaS having this slow ramp and all this kind of stuff, but like I'm going to call bullshit on that and say we can do way better. Because like we're at numbers that we barely got to like a year ago in Crazy Egg in terms of signups. And yes, it's a little bit of a different business. And by the way, this is the first question you would probably ask, well, didn't you already have Crazy Egg? Didn't you like already? No, we haven't touched that user base. That user base has never got an email, a message, or anything very deliberate about Hello Bar. We don't even promote it. So it's not like we're using that advantage. And honestly, the reason we are is that product doesn't have product market fit the way we want it to have yet. Uh, and we, had, we bought the product, so we still have a lot of work to do. And so um, I think you can grow faster. I don't think you need that slow SaaS ramp graph anymore. And if anyone wants to talk about it, happy to talk about that too. Um, cool, so that, that ends the presentation, but I got a couple quick things, or one main thing. So I want, uh, like, this is my favorite conference. And I, and I never get nervous when I speak. I get nervous in front of all of you. So, uh, and I think a lot about what to say. And you know, I, I would probably be really bummed out if I, for some reason, missed it. Um, and and, and what, I, what, I, what, I really, uh, what, what I really think is interesting about this is that um, there's so many of you that I've watched grow. Some of you I've talked to over the years. Some I haven't, but I've been able to watch from the, from the sidelines. Uh, even someone like Patrick watched him grow over time in this business, and now he's onto something awesome. Uh, that's really his calling, so to speak. And uh, so I think uh, Xander, Rob, uh, Mike, uh, Sherry, uh, and anyone else that's involved in this deserves a, a yeah that the clap. Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, so, I, I, and, and I don't think I would even be able to grow my businesses as much as I have without this event. So it's that important to me. Um, so uh, Rob did this, I think he did it a couple times, but there's three actions, three relationships. So is there anyone here that so far hasn't got this? Like, you don't have, do you have three actions? Yeah? Three relationships? So if you don't, I will personally make sure you do. So you come to me, find me, email me, whatever. Let's make sure we do this, because I think these are very good goals, and this is the reason this conference exists and is so awesome. So with that, uh, I think we have time for questions. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. We do indeed. Let's cool. give a round of applause to Heaton. Thank you. Thank you. So if you're putting that survey together for your competitors, how do you get enough people to take it so that you can get information from it? Yeah, so the number's actually about 30, and you can already get good directional information, and most people can get to 30. Uh, the more data you have, the more uh, accurate it'll be, but like just survey methodology, like on long-form surveys like that, uh, just 30 people will give you good signals, so I wouldn't stress that, but like 
Um, we've seen surveys with thousands of responses pretty fast. Uh, it depends on your user base. It depends on if you're willing to pay for it if you're doing a competitor's one. But I don't know, that, that learning is like priceless, <laughs> as you can probably tell from my graphs and stuff. Was there one here? Me next. So on the product market fit stuff, or the surveys, yeah. uh, so for non-SaaS businesses, what, what are the, how would you change those questions instead of? Yeah, um, you can tweak them a little bit. I'm happy to help you with your specific business. Most of them don't need to be tweaked, uh, except like, uh, actually, yeah, most of them don't need to be tweaked. You just tweak them a little bit. I've actually did them for, I've done them before for my Twitter followers. So I did a product market fit survey for the people following me on Twitter, right? So you can do it for anything. It's not just for SaaS. That was my whole sort of point. Uh, maybe things like alternatives might not be as relevant. Right? But like at the end of the day, they're getting a core benefit and all that kind of stuff. So it's just, it's just a little bit about the tweaking the language not, and just making sure if someone's reading it in the context of getting it for like your consulting business or you know, like your Twitter account even, it just makes sense to them. You have something specific like a book. Like a book? Oh, a book's great. Like, like if, if, is this an e-book or something? Or? Yeah, so like I, I'd consider sending this like maybe even like a week after they bought the book or three or four days and be like, I'd love to hear from you, right, and know what you got out of it. Um, so yeah, you would just tweak the questions to be for a book. Again, happy to help you tweak them. It's not, it's a product though, right? Everything's basically a product one way or another, right? So a book is, is not any, any, any different. You might just say, my book, you know, or whatever instead of product name. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just think logical. Again, happy to help, but like I, we, I've, I've seen it done for everything. <laughs> so. Hey, uh, so on the same topic on the survey, so the 40%, if that's uh, getting to that, it seems like it's largely a function of who you ask, because um, if you just ask the world at large and it's not, you know, they're not targeted towards what you want, then you're going to get a really low signal. So I guess like how, how do you constrain the boundaries of who to ask when you're doing the survey. Yeah, so if, uh, if you're just asking, if it's customers, just, just ask customers that have logged in in the last like two to four weeks, right? I've done it on even canceled people um, and stuff like that. Uh, tweak the survey a little bit and do it. Um, but generally, like, as, long as, they're, they're, as long as they're logging in and active, it's fine. And it really depends on how many, the numbers you actually have in your specific business. Um, but overall, just just trying it will get you good signal. I know a lot of people worry about, oh, it's only this type of customer filling it out and all that. In my experience, it tends to be, even with a small number, you get a pretty, pretty good mix of people. Just because the first question will tell you your mix, right? If, if enough people are saying the different sort of options, then you know you have a decent mix of people. Um, so I don't stress that too much on most of this kind of open-ended serving. I think when you're doing A-B testing or you're doing more quantitative things, the number and the quantity matter a lot more. In this case, I'm just trying to learn. So even if I had 10 responses, I'll look at it, right? Obviously, I probably want 20, 30 more, but like it already can tell you directionally where you're at and how things are going. Other questions? So you mentioned uh, surveying your competitors. Do you just do that through like Google AdWords or something? Um, we've used AdWords. Um, you know, on Twitter with their paid advertising, you can target another account's followers. So we've done that. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, <laughs> one time we partnered with an email list that had the audience we wanted and just paid them to go send out the survey and find out. Yeah, that works. Uh, yeah, it, 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 I've said this at previous events here or previous times here, but like beg, borrow, lie, steal. Like, just figure it out, right? You need the responses. This is very important to your business. I can't stress that enough. And so I'll do whatever I can. If I don't have money, I'll go figure it out. If I have to like sit in front of a conference and get them to fill it out and give them 50 bucks, like whatever, right? Like, so I think I, I would just find all the strategies. Generally though, on Facebook and Twitter, you can target people who like a page or are following a certain account. And that's been, that's actually been pretty useful for us. I know some people say, oh, should I give money away or all that? I, I, you can if you want. I, I think it doesn't really bias them in this kind of survey if you're doing your competitors. You should not give any incentive, though, for your customers. Eden, yeah. can you talk about the right side of that chart and why you had uh, <laughs> the step and the ramp out there? Can you talk, talk a little bit about that part yeah. of the chart? Yeah. Um, so uh, my co-founder and I, this was, I don't know, more than 18 months ago, maybe like two years ago, we actually got a new CEO at Kissmetrics. 
And the, the, the specific part of it is we were just spending more time on the business. And then, and then we just found some really quick, quick wins we weren't able to think about, right? So it was most of a depth of thinking. So a few things we did is we actually started focusing on our marketing site a little bit more and started running more tests because we didn't have anyone doing that at the time. And then we, uh, uh, because, partly because of Samuel and, and some of his thinking and help, we started working on our onboarding a little bit more and trying to optimize parts of it. Um, we found a whole bunch of quick wins at that time. So that, that was mostly it. Um, one, one of the bumps uh, in there, I think the second bump uh, in there was actually uh, when we started, uh, we, we actually, we called it a reverse funnel at the time, but previously you'd have to pick the pricing and then put in your email and all that. But the thing we knew is we wanted more volume at the top of funnels so we could run more tests below. So that was like really constraining our business. So we actually just tweaked it and made it so sign up happened first and then pricing page and other things. We also do a lot of cool stuff that this was implemented at the time, which is um, it, if we got your email first and you didn't, get, it's credit card up front in Crazy Egg. So if you didn't fill out the credit card, we start emailing. We do our own retargeting, basically. But we'll do, we'll do email retargeting. So we'll email you, depending on where you were in the funnel. We also implemented something else where if you come back to the site, you're kind of stuck on where you left off. So it's like check out card abandonment theories, but apply it to a marketing site funnel where you have credit card up front. That was very effective. Yeah, it works really well. <laughs> yeah. All right, we have time for two more. So if you're entering a new marketplace, can you use this just on a generic market? So if you're selling mousetraps, can you say, how do you feel about your current mousetrap provider just to see where people are? Uh, you, want to pick a, you want to pick a specific product in the market. So you'd pick... You don't want to make it a generic one. You want to pick... Like, mousetraps or Joe's mousetraps, so you'd be... Yeah. Able, okay. You just want to pick a specific one. The, what's fascinating is when you start doing this with like, like real world goods and stuff, like you start figuring out all this crap. Like I, we did it with a, a company a while ago. Uh, I just did it for fun. And uh, you, you, like an e-commerce site. So imagine an e-commerce site selling something specific. So let's say like, um, I don't know what's on my mind right now. Let's say like these, this backpack I have, right? If you did it on the backpack, you'd actually figure out what people are using the backpack for. There's one of the questions in there. I don't know if I had it in there. I, I don't remember, but like, of like what type of person would be great for this product. That one's great because then you could tweak all your positioning. So I, I'd go, I personally would go nuts on this. Like it's, it's been really valuable. It's like, yeah, it's like a... Yeah, it's crazy. And then when you start analyzing, so the whole goal is like, you want to figure out what the value prop that the very disappointed people set. You don't really necessarily, if you have enough of them, but you don't care about what anyone else said because you want more of those people. What you tend to find as patterns is that there's actually a big difference between those four grades and the benefit they got. All right, who'd like to ask the final question of MicroConf 2015? No pressure. I might need help answering this one. Thanks for the great talk. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but when you put up that red chart with Hello Bar, I right away went to hellobar.com and I tried to find out what it was. And you tried to find what? Tried to find out what it was. Yeah, sure. Um, but all I got was enter your URL and then I clicked next and then it asked me what I wanted to do and then I sort of went back to listening to you. So I don't have any clue what that is, but it sounds interesting. Can you tell us about it? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it was the first product. We, we actually bought that product a couple years ago. Um, but this company, Digital Telepathy, built, built it. We liked the name and the branding, and it was called Hello Bar. It still is. And basically, it, you put a JavaScript on a site, and you get a bar at the top of the page that can direct your visitors. That's what they originally built. Um, so it was like pre-Sumo Me and pre-all these things out there. They were the first ones to do it. So we bought it a couple years ago. And since then, we've added a whole bunch of stuff to it. Like uh, now, and this isn't even announced. We just did this a few weeks ago. But you can do modals and pop-ups and sliders. We've added email collection since, which didn't exist in it. So it's basically a, a, a bar tool, but also it'll do the pop-ups and sliders and stuff like that. And it's just like, you know, like, like imagine like Drip having the slider and the pop-up. We do all those, but we don't do the, the email marketing and automation outside of it. We plug into whatever exists. We'd love to plug into you guys at some point. So, yeah.